Hey, what's going on, everybody? And welcome to the Blazers Edge podcast. I am Dan Morang, your co-host. Join with me this week as, well, looks like going forward, uh, Miss Tara Bowen Biggs, team mom here. And, uh, you know, it's it's summertime where we're... <laughs> One of those things where we're sitting here kind of grinding and waiting for things to happen. And we, we've had plenty happen over the last week or so. And now we're kind of stuck in not only, you know, NBA basketball limbo, but Blazers basketball limbo as we're trying to figure out what this team is really going to formulate into. We've, we've discussed some of the the power forward issues that we have coming into the season. And as Dave Deckard's got uh, an article up on the site right now. Um, but this week, I think we're going to focus a little more on the wing and the guards with the recent Alan Crab trade. And right now, go ahead and bring in Tara. Tara, you know, how, how are you feeling right now? What, what, what's what's going on in your mind as, as we get within almost two months of preseason basketball? Well, it's sure been a busy summer, Dan. I mean, the Blazers themselves haven't been doing a lot, as we all know, but tons of things have been happening around the NBA. And then just when I was about ready to turn off my notifications from Adrian Wojnarowski, uh, along comes the news that the Trailblazers have traded Alan Crabb. So kind of exciting that something has happened in Blazer land because it was awfully quiet. Honestly, it's been a, a it's been keeping me up at night not because I'm worried about the team per se, but because I'm just trying to figure out what the Blazers are going to do with that extra roster spot. It's such an interesting puzzle. Yeah. You know, when this trade was was first announced and and I know you you probably talked to Eric Griffin about this. uh, My initial thought was this has got to be either option one part of helping facilitate a deal for Carmelo to Houston. That, that, I mean, this has got to be the first domino to fall. So you seriously thought that that was on the t- – you seriously, like, are giving that consideration, like, that's on the table? Yes. I, I still think – because I think Carmelo wants out of New York, and he wants to go to Houston. The the the, the, the Melo's camp and everybody around that has basically said that Houston is, is it. But not the part where Portland actually gets Carmelo. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't think Carmelo's coming to Portland. Uh, at, at, at no point in time did I ever think that was real. I think that uh, – like as a lot of people have discussed already, I think that was a lot of PR and marketing from Portland and Neil O'Shea trying to, to put some cloud out there. Um, and now that that could still happen, but I think it puts Portland in a better position financially to make a, a moves either now or going forward. You know, they're excuse me, they're within you know two and a half million dollars of the luxury tax right now with the with the way things sit. That means they can make moves that allow them to be more flexible without Alan Crabbe's contract there. And it seems like it does give them more options going into next year. What with Nurkic coming up, with um, you know us needing to sign him, with some, uh, with uh, Vonley uh, coming into the last year of of his contract. And I guess we should say that at, at, as of this point, um, August first, the Blazers have not yet waived Andrew Nicholson. Although it was reported like immediately by Woj that the Blazers were planning on stretching him. So. It, Hasn't become a which if it's yet. coming from Woj, you assume that that's coming basically from straight from the mouth of Neil Olshay. That's typically how if if, if you're familiar with the, the, the communication chain, if it's t- if it's said by Woj or Zach Lowe uh, or Mark Stein, that it's typically straight from Neil Olshay. So and as, yeah, as far as I understand, they don't need to do it until the end of the month. So if if the end of the month comes and goes, then we got a different story. Exactly. There's 30 more days still. And you're talking about training camp coming up still a little ways away. So there's still time to make something happen where it's not going to impact how training camp looks. So internally, Portland's got some things to figure out if there is no other move right now. Because, yes, they have the extra roster spot. But in trading Alan Crabb for a guy like Andrew Nicholson, you're not getting a like-for-like player. So let's, let's, let's say Nicholson isn't stretched. That's another player that you're putting in there that really doesn't make a whole lot of sense for Portland's immediate plans. That doesn't that doesn't seem very likely. And even if they do stretch him, like the Blazers are they can go into the season with 14 people on the roster. You have to carry 13. Um, but I don't as far as I could tell, I I read a couple of uh, different articles and I read as you know some of the um the Larry Coon CBA FAQs that was a terrible sentence. <laughs> the Larry Coon Collective Bargaining Agreement frequently asked questions. Um, and as far as I could tell, um, 
you know, a team has to carry a minimum of 13. The whole league has to average at least 14 throughout the year. But, uh, you know, so it's conceivable that if they haven't uh, made a move at the beginning of the year, that's possible. Um, but let's let's b- back up a little bit and talk for a second about what Alan Crabb did contribute to the team so that we can kind of try to unpack w- and, you know, maybe guess, look into the read the tea leaves about what we think the Blazers might do. So let's talk about what Alan Crabb did contribute to the team that is now, let's say, gone with that has gone with him. Obviously, three point shooting. We know that he had a great year of three point shooting last year. Some of the other things that he brought to the uh, to the team, Dan. What do you think? Oh, is, is it was there supposed to be something else besides three point shooting? Because there wasn't. Because I mean, there there really wasn't with Alan Crabb. He, for all the talk of the potential and the salary and the contract and all that stuff, yeah, it bothered me. It, it, it bothered me for what his contribution was at that point. But if you were one of those people that thought that Alan Crabb had another gear that he could develop a, you know, a, a handful of dribble moves. Basically have a Wesley Matthews type ascension. Like every year come back with something new to your game. You, you, could, you could understand, even if you don't agree with it, you could understand why they did what they did. But that just hasn't been Alan Crabb's MO at, at any point in time in Portland. He's always been a guy who was a three-point shooter, and you're like, well, maybe he can figure it out defensively. Maybe he can add a, a, a couple dribble moves to a, to a closeout on a defender. He's a good good to great mid-range shooter. He's good coming off screens, but you never really saw that manifest itself. He, he'd catch coming off a screen wide open, and he'd hesitate to shoot. So the things that he was capable of doing weren't necessarily materializing because of his role or his confidence or um, something with, within the, the, the confines of the, of the team system. Well, I did think of a couple of other things that – not necessarily that he did, but that he was, that I, I think do contribute to how he filled out that roster spot. And one of the things is that he was taller than Dame and CJ. He was a taller guard. Like, so we could switch out and put in at least a somewhat, you know, even if not a whole bunch, he was at least taller because we definitely don't have height um, with Dame and CJ. And, you know, Crab had at least three inches. Well, so that's a little something. And the, another thing that I think was kind of important about his game is that as far as I could tell, he was fairly low usage. Like he didn't need the ball in his hands a lot. Contrast that with say Evan Turner, who's a guy who likes to handle the ball more. Crab could be out on the floor and be effective without having the ball in his hands. So that seemed, those two things seemed pretty important to uh, who he was as a player when. uh, That's part of the problem with Crab though. His usage rate fluctuated from, 2015 16 to 16 17 he actually dropped quite a bit and 2015 16 was supposed to be you know him showing improvement the the growth because in 14 15 you know he's an 11 and a half percent usage rate basically he's just he's just out on the floor 15 16 he's at 16 and a half that's that's a huge increase well then 16 17 he's at 14.9 where he's dropping down again when he's supposed to be featured more heavily and I think that was always the, the biggest issue with him. Now, Cram presents length. There, there's no doubt about that. But it wasn't like it was incredibly useful length other than the occasional steal. Now, his steal percentage, I think, was the highest or second highest on the team. It, it, it goes back and forth between him and McCollum for, for the season. Um, but uh, So you don't think when you have a lot of players who like to handle the ball a lot – that having a low usage player who could shoot um, uh, reliably off the pass, you don't think that was like a characteristic that uh, they, the Blazers might look for to replace. You need that guy. You need a three and D guy, but if you're going to play 30 minutes a night, you have to, you have to take the opportunities that come your way. And I think that was one of the bigger detractions from Alan Crabb. If you're going to be the three and D guy, it's great that you're, that you're great from a, from a percentage standpoint, but you got to give the attempts up. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's put it this way. Yeah, he only took 10, uh, uh, yeah, for 36 minutes he took 10 attempts. No, 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 Crab was at, it was at 4.8 first per 36. Oh, threes. Oh, okay. I thought we were talking all overall. No, 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 I'm, I'm talking, talking threes here. If you're putting up 4.8, Al Farouk Amino is putting up 4.3. That's a problem. 
Yeah, um, yeah, Crab should have been shooting many more threes than um, Aminu, especially with his uh, much higher shooting percentage. Okay, so we can agree that besides threes, he had some length. We disagree on whether or not having him uh, be low usage <laughs> was useful to the team. Um, you can be low usage in the sense that you don't require the ball. That's what I'm talking about. There's plenty of guys in the league that don't require the ball that have a higher usage rate because when the ball, Wesley Matthews was a guy who had a high usage, but he didn't require the ball because his, his peak in Portland, his usage rate was around 20%, I believe. And that was because when the ball ended up in Wesley Matthews' hands in the corner, it was a shot. It wasn't a shot that was passed up. Think about the time that you had Wes and Nick at the same time. The starkest contrast between the two, it's the same kind of issue we had with Crab. When the shot was there for Wes and he was supposed to take the shot, never did you scream at the TV or in the arena or at the radio, shoot the ball, Wes. Were you in my living room all season, Dan, listening to me yelling at Alan Crab <laughs> to shoot the ball? Everybody was. Because, I mean, the guy shot almost 45% from three. He's got a stroke and a half. There's no question about that. Like anybody who wants to criticize on Alan Crab on 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 you know A through Z is fine. You cannot criticize the fact that the dude is a stone cold shooter from deep. He's a hell of a shooter from the mid range, and that's that's the issue is that you see that that's a definite definite weapon. He's one of the better pure shooters in the entire league, and yet he's not getting up shots. So that's that when I talk about usage rate is is kind of a weird stat in that yes you need guys with different usage rate stuff to function within the team. Mo Harkless is a perfect example. Mo has a low usage rate because he doesn't really. Cause he's like the third option or fourth option. He, exactly. And he does, and he doesn't need the ball. He, if he, if he, if Mo is shooting, it's a corner three or off a cut or in transition for a dunk. And it's after the other two avenues have been cut off for <laughs> the ball handler. Correct. When Alan Crabb is on the floor, Alan Crabb is supposed to be catching and shooting. That, that's that's his, his his that that's his role. So when he's not doing that, you're devaluing what is an incredibly valuable asset. And so I think I think that's where a lot of the frustration with with his game lies, especially when you consider he's he's supposed to be a three and D guy, and you're not getting the 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 defensive chops out of it. Eric Griffith has talked about it uh, quite a bit actually in a few different articles about how you know by the end of the season, you know Crab's supposed to be the defender, but Crab's defense was so subpar at points that, you know, the, they're instead of putting Crab on, on the on the top flight wing threat, they're just saying screw it, just put Dame or CJ on it. We're not getting anything more out of Crab anyways. Let Crab play a passing lane. What if I amended what I said to say that uh, Crab doesn't uh, demand um, like to have to handle and dribble the ball, and you know he doesn't he doesn't hog the ball. Like Dame and CJ can can hold onto the ball as long as he's ready to go when it goes into his hand. Whereas other players may dribble around and play around with the ball more. Alan Crabb yes. was was more clear in his role. Like my job is to uh, shoot the ball or hesitate and pass it off. But, yeah, his, <laughs> but he I guess has, what his I was options A and B. What yeah? What I was getting at was that he is not somebody who demands um, the dribbling the ball a lot and handling the ball a lot. Um, you no, know, he, like he doesn't take the he doesn't take the ball away from uh, he doesn't take the ball away from Dame and and CJ. No, not by any means. Let's let's move on to what it is that you think uh, the Trailblazers need the most now with this. I mean, obviously, you know, having we have two really good three point shooters, but that's not enough. Right. <laughs> and that's honestly, that was the biggest issue, I think, with Portland last year besides defense. Uh huh. And this is something I, I, I've kind of beat the drum on this for a couple of years now in that uh, Portland used to have the market cornered on three point shooting. Think about this, you know, three, four years ago. Portland had Dame, CJ, Crab, Wes Matthews, Nick Batum, uh, Aaron Aflalo, uh, uh, Will Barton. I mean, they they had shooters all up and down the roster, all over the place. Now, what what, what do they have? You've got Evan Turner, who's a career. Uh, uh, he may have gotten it above thirty um, percent for his career now, but he, he's a subpar three point shooter. Al Camino, that's a subpar three point shooter. Mo Harkless, subpar three-point shooter. Nurkic is supposedly adding that range to his game. We don't have anybody right now who's just money. 
like, oh, he's got it. Yeah, he's li- it's likely to go in. Uh, yeah, we don't we don't have anything like that. Or do we? CJ is the only guy on this team who is a stone cold shooter. Now, Dame is a clutch shooter. He's not a percentage shooter. He's his the fact that he takes so many, but he makes so many makes up for that. That that bumps his effective field goal percentage up quite a bit. But you're still not at. I mean, if, if you toss out Conton, if, if you're only looking at, at rotation players, Crab had the best effective field goal percentage on the team by a large margin. So that that that's something that's difficult to replace as far as floor spacing and gravity is concerned. And that that's that's a big time concern for Portland heading into this year. I. I th- I think you may have touched on this already, but is there anything that um, Crab was doing on defense that the Trailblazers would need to make sure that um, is covered now by somebody else? Make sure? Not necessarily. Um, The best points in basketball are are in transition. And Crab did create, I think, the second most transition points on the team last year, either by finishing them or, or generating a steal. Okay. Yeah, he was he um he seemed as I recall pretty uh good at stealing. He was yeah, able he, to I mean, his, his steal percentage. I mean that, that's all those more. those ridiculously long arms come into play. He he would get into pass lanes and create those opportunities. Um so that's something that's difficult defensively to replace um when you're not bringing in somebody else who is able to to create those kind of free points. Though though I mean when you the average margin of victory in the NBA is, is plus or minus five points. Um, two steals would be a big that's 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 a big that's a big time number to try to replicate um, night in, night out. So that kind of makes me stretch scratch my head along with obviously the the three point um, percentage in the floor spacing because it's not just crab's ability to knock down the three in the points that, that creates but the floor spacing now what's that look like for the second unit i mean you've got evan turner out there with with cj in the second unit i mean who else is going to be on the floor i mean and you're, are you hoping that swanigan comes out there because now if you run evan turner and if ed davis is out there with no alan crab and you've got harkless and aminu Where's the shooting coming from? Do you think that the Blazers may look to, um, you know, the uh, Connaughton or Lehman for an increased role in that way? Or do you think that they haven't really uh, shown that yet? I mean, Connaughton, we're waiting to find out if he's even going to get picked up next year. You know, uh, Dame obviously, you know, got lots of playing time right from the beginning. But AC and CJ, they both like really didn't see a lot of increase in their minutes until their third year. Um, you know, so Pat Connaughton is looking at his third year. Layman is looking at his second year. Do you think that um, that's, that's something that Stotts might try out? I imagine he'll probably at least give it a try, I right? I mean, right now with the way the roster sits, somebody's going to have to. Somebody has to t- pick up Crab's minutes. It's not like Crab was only playing, you know, a couple minutes a night. He was playing nearly 30 minutes a game. That's a that's a big slice of the pie that needs to go to somebody. And yeah, I've heard a lot of people like, well, it means that, that Dame or CJ is going to be on the floor more. And I'm like, how? These guys are playing 36, 37, 38 minutes a night. You, you can't all of a sudden slot one of those guys in and go, hey, here's six more minutes for both of you. That's that's not going to fly. Uh-huh. So, you know, when you're in the workplace and you have your work team and somebody leaves and then it's an opportunity for your team to look around and go, OK, do we want to just replace the person who left or do we want to rewrite the job description? Um, how would you do it if you were the Trailblazers? Would you look for somebody to replace Alan Crabb who has the same skills or or better or is this an opportunity you think to, uh, like I said, rewrite the job description? I'm kicking a lot of tires in the free agent market. I'm kicking a lot of tires in the free agent market right now. So are you looking for just whoever's available and will come? I mean, what are you looking for? What are you, What's in the job description? I, I think if you're going to bring in anybody, I think, you number one, you need to bring in a veteran. Because this team is still very young and lacks a, a veteran presence. Um, and I think you need to have a two-way player. So that kind of hones down the list. I heard a lot of people like, well, Portland needs some defense. Maybe you should look at a guy like Tony Allen. I'm like, 35-year-old grindfather is not the guy you want to give 20-plus minutes a night to. Not not in today's NBA. 
even prime Tony Allen would be kind of a problem for this team because of his offensive limitations. Um, I, I think if you're looking at guys, obviously Gerald Henderson is somebody that's been mentioned a ton, and he's probably at the top of the list. He's familiar with the system. He's familiar with the players. Um, yeah, he's not an elite three-point shooter, but he is a legit two-way player. He gives you positional flexibility. Um, he, he can come right in. You don't have to worry about how he's going to integrate. You know how Gerald Henderson is going to play within the system. He could be the new Steve Blake. This, I know what? Uh, he, he, we got to get him at least three more times before, before, we, before he gets to Steve's level. Every journey to becoming the team Steve Blake starts with, you know, one step. And that might be coming back this first time. He still would have to come back at least one more time. Exactly. But like you said, somebody who knows, he's also happens to be available. Um, 76ers waived him. So he's available. One thing that uh, he's pretty much a pure shooting guard, right? So he's a- along the lines of crap. Like he's not going to be somebody he's bigger who than crap. Uh, is a- also going to need. Oh, that's true. He, he- but he's not going to need to be like controlling the ball a lot. I, I think that both him and Evan Turner on the floor at the same time would be a little bit of an issue because they're both better with the ball in their hand, but it could create some opportunities for, for cuts for Portland because Henderson is a guy that obviously finishes above the rim very well. Oh, remember how nice he used to jump so oh, high. Henderson's oh, one of the smoothest, jump- he was he's one of the smoothest jumpers and leapers in the league. And he's explosive, explosive as can be. And I think Portland could use some of that kind of athleticism, um, but there's other guys that are out there that aren't really being talked about right now. And those are the, the guys like, uh, Brandon Rush, you know, a, a Randy Foy, a Anthony Morrow, the guys that, I mean, you, you could bring back the corpse of James Jones. Um, if, if you got him for a vet minimum, it just is a guy that's going to scare opponents for a couple of minutes a night to knock down some threes. Um, there, there are players out there that, that could fit that role. If you were talking about, Wanting to use guys like Connaughton or Jake Lehman or something like that, you could get an older savvy vet who's there for a purpose, such as floor spacing. But at the same time, you're not leaning as heavily on them as you would like a Gerald Henderson. Okay, so if you brought in an older vet that was going to play fewer minutes, that might be the opportunity for those younger guys to show, you know, to have time for development. But then you would have one extra player who could come in and also. play play some of those minutes yeah exactly i mean that, that's really what you're looking at i mean otherwise you're looking at, at guys that, you know that are that are still free agents that are out there um the guys that i listed you, you're either limited to very young guys or very old guys or some of the guys in between like a luke babbitt also another candidate for steve <laughs> exactly uh, the new steve blake <laughs> but yeah i mean actually I, do you want to know who i have in in mind you want to hear who I'm thinking Who's about? That? Okay, so I was worried that this could be a terrible idea, but I also kind of, the more I think about it, I love it. Jason Terry. Jet wouldn't be bad um, in the Here's savvy why I like him. bench coach. 38, I think, years old, uh, but he still is shooting over 40%, or yeah, over 40% from three he's not playing very much and he's not a volume shooter so that he you know he wouldn't you know come in and like take as many shots or minutes as alan crab did but it goes back to i think it would be great to have a veteran on the team who's been there and i don't i'll say this over and over again i don't think he needs to take any you know leadership uh uh position from damian damian's got the leadership and cj they have that covered but Jason Terry's experience, he won the championship with Dallas. So he's been all the way through a championship run. He knows all that. He knows everybody in the league. And he just simply loves playing ball. Yeah, I think he would be a fun addition to the team. And I think he would also, I think he could also uh, help a lot by providing a lot of that wisdom. The, it, it's actually, in theory, it's not a bad idea simply because the minutes and allocations where Crab was playing a lot of the two, if you if you're bringing in somebody like Terry or any other point guard really, instead of having CJ play the point with the second unit, you essentially just move CJ to the two, and CJ could still run primary ball handling duties, because Jason Terry's a great spot up three point shooter as well, um, and that would probably help alleviate. I'd lean more towards if they're going to bring somebody in, it needs to be a bigger guard, because right now Portland is 
lacking um, that length and yeah, that size. Yeah, size is not his. Uh... In, in yeah, I mean Terry's. I mean Jet's my size, <laughs> and that that, yeah. doesn't, that doesn't fly in the NBA for for a long period. Yeah, of time. that would definitely not cover the uh, this the size requirement. Um, yeah, for sure. But I mean, it, it's definitely something like that. I mean, really, any of the point guards are really any of those guys are are you know, available to make that work. Um, it would just present, I think, a four hurdles for Portland, especially defensively um, with this season. I, I don't think that's necessarily the best way to go about it. But again, we're talking about a Portland team right now that's still scrambling to find that, who their power forward is. And right now we don't know what the, the bench lineup is going to look like. So they've, they've got a lot of questions that they need to answer still. Um, and adding more talent, um, proven talent to the roster isn't necessarily a bad thing. So uh, uh, normally I'd be, you know, adding a guy that old <laughs> to, to the roster, uh, I'm not a fan of. But with the way Portland's shaping up right now, if that was their best course of action, I honestly I wouldn't be against it. You know, an, another thing to consider is that you you wouldn't probably have to lock yourself into a multi year contract with him. <laughs> and so I think I think this move of uh, trading Alan Crab is a lot of, about positioning for next year. Like, okay, none of the, these guys didn't develop the way that we thought they were going to. We're going to cut our losses and get ready for next year. And so. I, I think if, you know, if it was me, if I was, you know, adv- not that I have any uh, business advising the Trailblazers, <laughs> but I think one course of action that they might take would be to, you know, have short contracts this year so that next year they have as much flexibility and as much mo- room to move as possible. Um, am I just like drinking the Kool-Aid on that one or does that seem like a reasonable course no, of action? No, it's absolutely reasonable and it's prudent. Portland, ne- Portland has needed to have cont- contractual flexibility for a while now. I Again, you know, talking about restocking the cupboard unless you're cleveland and you're mortgaging your future every single year that you have lebron james trying to keep him happy or your golden state and you're mortgaging your future by trying to keep that core together you need to constantly maintain contractual flexibility you need to have rookie deals you need to have stars locked up and you need to have guys on vet mins and tp uh, uh, you know the the taxpayer exemption or the mle deals short term deals value deals you've got to have a mixture of all of them to be successful because you need these pieces not only to be successful on the basketball court but on the business side of things you need them to be flexible to facilitate free agency to facilitate trades Part of the problem with Portland and making trades was that they don't really have, or they didn't over the last couple of years, they didn't really have chips that allowed them to make incremental moves one way or the other. It was either, hey, we've got a pile of rookie deals or, hey, we've got really expensive mm-hmm. deals. There was really no in between. I mean, you look over the last couple of years, the only guys that have been on rookie deals, you know, CJ got his deal a year early. I mean, you're now, with the exception of, of Mason Plumley and Nurkic, you had Vonley. But everybody else was was on their deals, and it just it made it very very difficult to get beyond that to bring other guys in or or move other guys out. I think it's really interesting the way free agency played out this year, and there are a lot of uh, guys out there who have not signed contracts um, who are going to be having to take one year contracts because you know they may have after last summer expected that they were going to get multi-year contracts. And then suddenly the, you know, the MBPA, <laughs> things have really dried up for that. The MBPA made a, I, I think a serious error in explaining salary cap smoothing to their union members because guys last year, they got theirs guys this year. They aren't getting theirs. It's, it's just not happening. People are the, the teams are much more prudent about who and when and where they're signing. That's that's what it comes down to. It's not like the money just dried up. It, people stopped overpaying for mid tier assets. Yeah, it certainly felt like last year there was a big uh, spending spree, and this year people are um, being much more conservative. I, I don't. Do you ever listen to the JJ Redick podcast? Oh yeah. Um, did you listen to this one where he talked about his experience of free agency? I found it super enlightening to hear it from the player's point of view. 
he talked about how initially like he had all these thoughts about what he was going to ask for and what he wanted. He wanted like a multi-year contract was like super important to him. And he also, I think, wanted to go to Brooklyn. So and he's like, we all say that we're not thinking about it during the season, but we're all thinking about yeah, it. These the guys talk about it in the locker room. Um, they, they, they know what, what's going right, on exactly. with these contracts, what, you know, what guys uh, around the league are getting paid and, and, you know, what the situations are with certain teams and when certain organizations and front offices and those inner uh, workings and relationships with certain teams. While a player may be a perfect fit salary cap wise and year wise and age wise and basketball wise, there are things going on within an organization that people on the day-to-day just don't know about and guys will go you know what i i don't want to play there i i don't i know what's going on inside that locker room and what's going on with that coach and with that gm and then you know, i'm just gonna stay away from that and so that's why some of these things don't always come to fruition it was really interesting to hear him talk about the contract that he eventually took of course with philadelphia for 23 million dollars for one year and you know everybody's saying obviously that's a massive overpay but that's what we needed to do because that's what worked out for our team because like we needed somebody this year but we didn't know what the future was because he also talked to brian colangelo um and uh you know so once uh jj reddick you know accepted the fact that he wasn't and it was really hard for him to accept the fact that he wasn't going to get the multi-year contract that he wanted so there's a lot of guys out there right now who are having to accept the fact that they're not going to get that multi-year contract that they wanted but the other interesting part was how fast the actual um negotiation or not negotiation but the actual thing went let's basically brian he was called by his agent and was like you know so this offer is on the table for you from philadelphia uh you have 15 minutes to decide and he was like, I'm 10 minutes from my wife. Like, I have to go talk to my wife first. I need, you know, I need more time. And they were like, well, that's how much time you have to make this decision. So, again, uh, really interesting to see it um, from the perspective of the team because they had all these other things that were waiting. So they had to, like, say we, they had to hurry him along because they had every all these other things waiting to uh, fall into place or not fall into place. So I just I, – I, I thought it was a, a really – educational um, piece to kind of get a little bit more of a sense about what it might be like for some of these individuals. Cause we talk about them a lot, like, you know, like they're a piece of paper, <laughs> um, but it was a really interesting human look at, at, at what free agency is like. And when you look at some of those guys who are like Mason Plumley still isn't, you know, our, our boy who was you know on our team for what, a year and a half, he still doesn't have anything. Um, it's kind of a scary world out there, I think. And, and, you know, guys who've made it this long or who've waited this long to to get a contract, I guess maybe things are looking up for teams because if you want to work next year, you kind of got to <laughs> take what you can get. Maybe. Yeah, you're basically looking at one, two, maybe three year deals, um, some MLEs and a, probably a lot of vet minimums if you want to, you know, get any kind of deal. And I mean, if you look at the list of guys that are still out there, Monte Ellis, Gerald Henderson, um, Tony Allen, C.J. Watson, Leandro Barbosa, Brandon Rush, Anthony Morrow, K.J. McDaniels, Trey Burke, Randy Foy, James Young. I mean, those are just, you know, those are the guards. I mean, you start looking at, at the forward position, and you, you've got a ton of guys out there. Um, somebody that Dave Deckard has loved for a couple of years now, Nikola Miritich, Tiago Splitter, Lavoy Allen, Chris Humphreys, Dante Cunningham, Shabazz Muhammad, who was supposed to be, you know, you know, one of the big tier free agents um, as far as RFAs go. Nerlens Noel. Yeah, Nerlens Noel. That surprises Dallas me. Dallas is putting the squeeze on him. I mean, he's not going to get crazy money. They're just they're letting the market dictate what's going to happen. And I think that for uh, an organization like Dallas, that that's incredibly good for them. But Nerlens Noel is probably sitting there scratching his head, like, wait, with the way everything went last year, you know, the the players association of the union. They they basically told me I was I was going to get paid. Yeah, yeah. If your if your time wasn't last year, you are kind of out of luck. <laughs> well, so um, you know, let's work on wrapping this up. Of we've we've talked all about uh folks who are available for uh, free agency who might be possible. Um, real quick, anybody who you think might uh you know be a trade end up like uh, realistically coming to Portland. You know, if if this Ryan Anderson to Portland to facilitate the Carmelo deal happening does go down, um, obviously that... I feel like we're right back where we started if that yeah. happens. <laughs> um, I guess it depends on what goes out with him. It, next thing is that... For, for him, I guess. I, you have to assume it, it has to be 
at least Maurice Harkless and probably somebody like Myers Leonard or Ed Davis to, to make that kind of deal happen to get underneath where they need to be contractually. But I'm wondering if, if part of that deal Portland ends up using some or all of the, the trade exemption they created with the Alan Crabb deal. And if that brings in a Trevor Ariza, which I don't think is really going to happen or an Eric Gordon, which I really don't think is going to happen, but that would solve a lot of the floor spacing, uh, offensive continuity issues that Portland is facing, even with Alan Crabb. It, it would solve a lot of the basketball problems. Exactly. Is that what you're getting at? But it wouldn't necessarily uh, provide them, offer them a more flexibility um, in the future as far as like roster flexibility. Exactly. So th- there's definitely things that w- would inhibit that. Um, other deals that are out there, you really – this time of year, it's hard to kind of make a trade because teams kind of have their roster set unless they're making a big time move and they, they want to lock in and see what their team's going to look like. So Portland may be basically stuck here unless, you know, they help facilitate a big deal um, until the trade deadline. And so Portland it, making this move, they may have made it full well knowing this is the roster they're going to have going into the season. And that's got to make yeah, like Portland we talked about at the beginning, they don't have to have yeah, they don't have to have fifteen players on their roster. That's what I was getting at at the beginning. Like they don't, there's nothing that says they have to have fifteen. Yeah, they don't. The they don't have the to make any more moves. And you know, as a fan, that kind of bothers me because you want this team to, to make another move to kind of fill out the way the roster is structured right now because there's there's huge holes in it right now. But do you want him to make a move just for the sake of making a move? Or do you want him to wait and see? Because, you know, Pollyanna talking here, maybe Jake Lehman turns out to be that dead-eye shooter that we were looking for. And he, you know, fills up a lot of what we lost uh, when Crab left. You never know. Like, Or do you want people to just make a move for the sake of making a move? I don't think it's the sake of making a move. I think if they make a move, it's going to be for a known quantity. So a Gerald Henderson type. And that doesn't solve the problem. It just kind of plugs the hole and makes it a bit more palatable going forward. Um, It makes a lot more sense basketball wise and even contractually going forward because you're not going to commit a ton of money and it's not going to be for a real long term. Um, But, I mean, we're we're talking about, you know, the Allen Crab size hole. There there was already roster problems at the wing because Evan Turner doesn't really fit with this team. Alan Crabb wasn't really playing up to what his potential or what people expected of him. Um, so those are two already issues that you had with the team. Um, you're losing an asset in three point shooting that you don't really have readily available. Um, that's a problem. <laughs> so, you know, there's, they created, I think more problems, but at the same time, they also, don't have any ready-made solutions and they're finding themselves in a Western conference that basically every team that's vying for a playoff spot got better. I mean, that's, that's a really, really tough pill to swallow. I think if you're a Blazers fan, like at least from my perspective. So uh, I hope they make a move. I, I sincerely do hope they make at least one more move to, to fill out. So you can at least, start to make sense of the depth chart going into the season. Now, I don't know if that's going to be a, a, a problem for them going forward, you know, internally, but from the outside looking in, that's, it's, it's not a good look. I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I don't know. I like to, I. You like to be the, you like to be the optimist. I know. I know. It's, it's, it's. Totally so, <laughs> so Dan, you're the, uh, the dark musings to my light musings. <laughs> We're in, we have different muse cages. And if you don't know what a muse cage is, you need to look up muse cage and type in Kobe and muse cage and you will be entertained for, uh, for days. Um, but I, I do think it's, it's hard right now because, you know, we can be like, Oh, everybody else has gotten so much better. And like, that is true. So what do we, you know, what do we do about it? We need to have at least something that's entertaining uh, for us to watch. I mean, what are we going to do? Just like walk away because we're not, you know, we don't, we're not going to win the championship. I mean, you know, it looks 
pretty unlikely that that's not going to happen this year. So what do we look to, uh, you know, to make this this year worth it? I mean, and I think the young players is one of the things that we need to turn to. I mean, we've got we 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 still have. I think it's really important that we give Nurkic a whole year, and I think that's why we have a lot of this. Why we need to not just go out and get somebody for long term. Why we just need to get somebody short term because Nurkic could work out beautifully, or he could have you know, a lot of the same issues that he did while he was in Denver. And so I think this is year, this is going to be a lot of wait and see this year. And I think we're going to also have to watch. Um, and, you know, I think we're going to be seeing a lot of young player development. I mean, it was like a couple of years ago, Stotts threw uh, Vonley into the starting lineup. I kind of feel like that's, co- I wonder if they're, he's going to just throw somebody in the starting lineup. Because remember what he said? I thought he needed some minutes. <laughs> you know, This might be the year that he decides that Jake Lehman needs some minutes. And we might see Jake Lehman in like the starting position for some reason. You know, just because what else can we do? Like, you know, with Golden State and, you know, other teams just getting better. I think you're kind of hitting the nail on the head right here. If you're not competing for champion championship, I think you, in my personal opinion, if you're not competing for one, you need to be building towards one. And I think the Alan Crabb deal was something. It was a, the deal itself, I think was a bad play in the first place. And I, I've said that probably about a billion times now. Um, getting out from under that is nice, but basically what you got out of it is a net negative, I believe. And taking a step backwards right now, when your plan wasn't that fantastic to begin with, in, in my view, th- that that doesn't bode well for Portland going forward. And I, I, so, do you think losing Crab was a t- was a step backwards? Yeah, and I think that kind of speaks to where Portland is. I, I always thought that they went, the second he signed that deal, that they needed to get away from it as soon as possible. But this- so you were were you in the chorus of people who thought that we needed to uh, that thought that the Blazers ought to have more roster flexibility? Yes. I mean, now that I mean, I mean, af- after the trade, I mean, obviously we can't go back in time, but now at least we have more flexibility, don't we? A little bit more, but we're not talking the fact that they weren't able to get under. It's overblown how much. Exactly. Okay. Everybody wants to talk to, to, to tout the, 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 the TPE as like the, it's worth its weight in gold. TPEs go unused regularly, Re- very regularly. It's nice to have to help facilitate something. But beyond that, you're just kind of it's it's meh. So it, it's really difficult to sit there and look at it like it was this really successful move. Granted, they got out from under it. In my opinion, that was a good move from a financial and long-term view standpoint. But as far as team building, you lost an asset who you overpaid and didn't get anything in return. It's, if we're talking about hindsight, it seems like it would have been a whole heck of a lot better to sign somebody like Gerald Henderson to that spot for half the cost for the same amount of years and be in a better position. But we can't go backwards. So in one minute, tell me what, what um, move you would recommend if you were the person who uh, was advising the trailblazers, what to do next, what would your recommendation be? If they can get Gerald Henderson for the, the mini MLE for, you know, for two years, do it. Is he? Does he qualify for a veterans minimum yet? Oh yeah, yeah. He, he he's twenty nine. Yeah, he, right? he yeah he qual- he should could he I think well let me I, I'm almost certain he does. I believe he has ten years service. And if he does, the vet the thing about the veterans minimum is you like get reimbursed for it, right? Yeah. So I mean, e- either way, I, I, the the mini MLE and the vet men are, are probably going to be pretty close to where uh, we're pretty close to each other. So. Um, but I mean, that, that seems like to be the best course of action. It's, it's not great, but if you're, if you're talking about moves that you can make that aren't going to limit flexibility going forward, that you don't have to worry about how to integrate with the system. I mean, how often can you say that the guy you're going to bring in is already familiar with the players, the coach, the system, the organization, the city where you don't have to worry about how he's going to, to come into the, and, and fit in. I mean, that's 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 a rare situation that you can talk about. So um, that to me gives him a leg up on basically everybody else, even if there is somebody that maybe talent wise or skill set wise was maybe a little bit better. I think because of all the other intangibles, 
Henderson is the best idea for the short term. All right. Well, there you go for Blazers executives who are listening to the Blazers Edge podcast. Uh, Dan's recommendation is Gerald Henderson. Uh, mine is, I, I do actually really like Gerald Henderson, um, but I'm also going to put in a plug for Jason Terry because I really think it would be fun to have a crusty old vet <laughs> who, <laughs> who can teach them all the dirty tricks that have been uh, tried on them before and have somebody with a, you know, a championship uh, to their name would be exciting. Anything else you want to say, Dan, before we wrap it up? No, we've got, uh, what, 63 more days until preseason so uh i think we'll have uh, plenty more time to talk about other things as, as things progress i'm so excited that the season is all everything is moving up a little bit earlier that's you know you know just a couple more weeks and we can just close the gap even between the off season and the preseason <laughs> this is basketball purgatory i mean that, that this time of year is basketball purgatory you're just sitting here like please god when you when you're begging for training camp that's when you know you're, you're just kind of jonesing so well, we still have the mellow shoe to drop and we still have the, you know, the Kyrie question out there. And are there any other big NBA storylines that we're really waiting on? Those are probably the two biggest ones that could really uh, shake things up. Yeah, I mean, the, the only thing there is I just can we just keep Kyrie in the Eastern Conference? We don't need another all star point guard in the West. That's that's basically my whole thing on that right now. <laughs> we ran out of time before we could talk about the Bill Simmons suggested uh, trade. Oh, <laughs> Let's just not acknowledge that. I, I put it out on Twitter and I just, I felt d dirty even discussing it. Folks, if you haven't seen it, you should uh, uh, Google that too, along with the muse cage. Um, That's <laughs> your homework. Bill yeah. Simmons Kyrie trade. <laughs> well, Dan, it was great to talk to you tonight. Um, you know, lots of food for thought to trying to figure out what's going to happen now that Alan Crabb is gone and how the Blazers are going to make up that roster spot. And if they do, uh, you can uh, let's, I guess we'll just remind the listeners that uh, they can subscribe to Blazers Edge on Stitcher and iTunes and pretty much whatever kind of podcast catcher you use i am on twitter at tcb bigs please uh send me any questions or comments you want dan how do people find you yep you guys as always you can find me on twitter at dmarang it's at d-m-a-r-a-n-g yes it's Morang like the pie for those that have ever questioned or wondered um hit me up anytime on twitter uh, my dms are open you can tweet at me uh, ask anything as far as well, really anything. I, I, I love just kind of shooting it on Twitter. So, um, but if you've got Blazers questions, it, it doesn't matter the time of day. Um, I'll, I'll always get back to you. Dan, thanks a lot for joining me on behalf of Dan Marine. Thanks for joining us on the Blazers Edge podcast. Mm -hmm.